Go ahead. Right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, the third lecture in this series on modified traces. Um, yeah, uh, today John's going to talk to us more about modified traces and maybe more about uh, ambidextrous objects and uh, ambidextrous traces. So uh, take it away. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, yeah, so my goal today is to tell you what happens um, in basically this is what Daniel just asked me five minutes ago if you were here is is can I relax the ribbon construct uh, restriction because that's pretty restrictive depending on on what kind of objects you're working with um, so but before we do that uh, I hope in the last two uh, lectures I convinced you that a so at least sometimes modified traces exist and B that they seem to give hopefully interesting non-trivial generalizations of results that you get for ordinary traces and dimensions so that they seem to play some actual interesting role in representation theory. Um, and then I ended with this, this sort of non-example where you're thinking about SL2, which is like one of the nicest things you might run into, or at least that's how I like to think of it. And, and it does, doesn't always admit um, non-trivial traces. So existence of traces is a bit of a mystery. So I wanted to remind you of, of sort of our basic setup and give you at least one theorem which tells you when traces exist. And then uh, towards the end of the talk, I'll give another existence theorem in a more general context. So here for the moment still, we're talking about a ribbon category and and modified trace on an ideal was just a family of linear functions, um, which satisfied a couple of, of hopefully reasonable axioms. And in particular, they make every object in that ideal ambidextrous in the sense that this equation that I wrote down right here, you don't know what I'm pointing at, right here is always true for any endomorphism of V tensor V. That's, that's the definition of ambidextrous. And conversely, if you give me a linear map on some object, which has this property, this ambidextrous property, then it will extend in a unique way to the ideal generated by that object. So certainly if you're trying to find ideals or prove they exist, well, the easiest road or a big road to doing that is, is to find a map like this and prove that it's ambidextrous for J because then you get to extend it to everything. And so if you're trying to find traces, one thing you can do is you can construct them explicitly. Like Nathan and Bertrand did this for GLMN in like their first paper basically. Um, I mentioned yesterday that Thorsten Eiersdorf and Hans Wenzel have done this more recently in some other settings, and they are also doing it, as I recall, in a pretty explicit way. Uh, and then, like what I did with Johnny Combs for this diagrammatic um, Galene category, we also did it in a pretty explicit way, where you just tell me how to define the, the, this T map and, and, and show that it has the right properties. Uh, the other thing you can hope for is some existence theorem. So that's what I wanted to talk about today a little bit some nice exist existence theorems. Okay, so the first one is still gonna be, whoops, it's still gonna be for ribbon categories. And I'm gonna assume that it's abelian, that it's a Kroll-Schmidt category. I mean, the Kroll-Schmidt theorem holds. So you should be thinking about like a finite dimensional Hopf algebra or something like that. And Let's and and so and where it has enough projectives. And let's let J be an object with the endomorphism ring J just being, you know, multiples of the identity. So for example, um, uh, I'm thinking of like a simple object or something like that, but you could think of a Verma module or something too. That could be okay, depending on your context. Okay, so I'm assuming that I, I have a Carl Schmidt category. So if I take J tensor J dual, then that's gonna be isomorphic to a direct sum of indie composables. And thanks to the unit and co-unit maps or the evaluation and co-evaluation maps, I should say, I have a map from the unit object to J tensor J dual. And because of, of the assumptions on what it means to have a duality, I have a, a 
a junction here so I can get an isomorphism of k vector spaces between these guys. And so by assumption, this was just k, so it's one dimensional. So my co-evaluation really just spans a one dimensional space and that's everything. So in particular, um, when I'm thinking about that map, there's only one map, this guy, from one into J tensor J dual. And it's got to go into one of my indecomposable sum ands. So there's some I such that HOM1 WI is not zero. Because if they're all zero, then the, this guy wouldn't be there. And then I can do everything for the evaluation map in just the same way and same discussion. And so there will be some J could be different such that HOM WJ1 is not zero. Okay, so that's just we're observing some stuff. And then the theorem here is, is that J, just a simple object or seemingly it acts like a simple object, is ambidextrous if and in fact, only if under this setup, I equals J. So the trivial module at the head of J tensor J dual and the one that's in the socle, they're in the same sum and. So where would you run into this kind of thing? For example, the prototypical sort of example that I'm gonna have in mind here is J could have been a projective indecomposable module or a pro sorry, a projective simple module, because I need its endomorphisms to be just the field. So if I happen to have a projective simple module, and if my category is unimodular, which exactly means that the projective indecomposable, which has the trivial object at its head, is the same as the one that has it in its socle. So I'm, that's just, I'm just rigging things up so that the theorem applies. Then this J will be ambi. So by that earlier theorem, any ambidextrous object generates a trace on the ideal it generates. This is projective. So the ideal it generates will be the ideal of projectives. So proj has a non-trivial trace. And, and then you can use this in, in, when we prove this theorem, we said, well, look, you can use this in lots of settings. Like there's many finite groups and their quantum doubles, which have such a projective simple. Um, you can look at the Lie algebra of an algebraic group and positive characteristic, because you've got the Steinberg representation. You can look at Lie super algebras and characteristic zero or an, an positive or an odd characteristic, as long as you stay away from type P and Q. If you're looking at those basic classical ones that I had talked about before, then you always have these simple uh, irreducible modules called the um, typical representations. And as Thorsten mentioned a time or maybe two ago now, that's sort of what you can bootstrap off of using the duflo Serganova functor to show that you've got traces for all the other irreducible objects. So that sort of gets you going in that case. And you know, for example, finite dimensional factor, factorizable ribbon Hopf algebras and characteristic zero satisfy this. So that would be a class of Hopf algebras that have this. So, you start to find it in a bunch of different places. I guess I should mention one more that I cannot answer any follow-up questions to. And that is if you're looking in conformal field theory, there's this thing called the 1P minimal model and associated to it is a category of representations which satisfies this definition. So there's sources and places like that as well. Okay, so Daniel wants me to get rid of ribbon. So let's do that. So what are going to be my setup for today, for the remainder of today? I'm still going to stick with a field, and I'll assume it's algebraically closed. That's something that's not too essential. You just have to be more careful about what you say then. Uh, and, and I'm going to still stick with C being a k-linear category. And my assumption here is that C is a pivotal category. So let's unpack what that exactly means without getting too in the weeds. I still have a tensor product. 
I still have a unit object. I still have left and right duals, which just to remind you meant that I had co-evaluation and evaluation maps, which as pictures look like this. That's left duals and right duals are just the same pictures where the labels are reversed. So uh, V and V dual. I think I called these primes at the time. And these pictures should satisfy straightening rules. So if you make a little S shape, then that should straighten out to the identity of whatever thing that you get. And the last thing, the pivotal bit, says that um, you have this additional assumption of this extra structure, which is that there's a natural isomorphisms. Let's just write that down. Um, from V to the double dual of V. Or to say the same thing a little bit more precisely, with, with, with the duality, you can upgrade the duality to a tensor functor. You can dualize morphisms. And if you dualize a tensor product, that will be isomorphic to the dual of the individual things, but in the reverse order. So I guess technically it's like on the op tensor product structure. But the double dual will actually be the same, um, uh, an honest monoidal category. And so what I really want here is I want this next thing to be an isomorphism from identity to double tensor. Um, this family of maps is giving me a uh, isomorphism of monoidal functors. So do you say you have to require this? I thought it would follow from the other ones. Uh, I think I need to require it. I don't think, okay. uh, yeah, I don't think I know what these are. Um, I think, so So the part above is rigid, right? That yeah. you have both. Having so, dual, so, so on is. Yeah, rigid. so if you just require that the left duals are the right duals, then I think like the left dual of the right dual is the original object or something like this. So I thought that the isomorphism is automatically there, but I'm not sure if it's like natural. Yeah, that's probably, that's probably right. But in any case, I, I want to make explicit that I have, have this guy, whether, whether I'm assuming it or, or I can squeeze it out of what I already know, I don't know. But, um, and, and I guess I should say, why do I want that? That's because I would like to be able to talk about, for example, a categorical trace. Whoa. And so if you gave me a map from V to V, I would like to be able to make sense of how to turn that into a number, sort of by closing things up in the, in the diagrammatic calculus. Well, the bottom is okay, because I have a co-evaluation. And yeah, what I would like to put up here, oh, I just did that again. What I'd like to do up here is just cap this thing off. But for to have a good theory, um, if I remember right, but now I feel like I'm misremembering. I really want to put this V on there so that I get V double dual and then do the evaluation. So maybe by assuming that I had left and right duals and that they coincided, that's forcing me to have this fee. But I sort of think of it like this, that this is the thing that I want to be able to do. Anyway, so, but that's a, I, what I don't have is I don't have a braiding. So in particular, I don't know how to cross things. And in particular, for example, I don't know that drawing this picture in the other direction I close it up on this side is necessarily the same thing, for example. That's an extra assumption. If, you're, if that would be true, then you'd be in a spherical category where you can kind of imagine everything's on the sphere and you can bring that strand out around the back. 
we don't know that we can do that. But so I have the data I need to talk about traces and dimensions of things. Uh, the other assumptions I want to have in play here, they won't be necessary for the definitions, but for some of the theorems to make sense, they'll, they'll be necessary. So I might as well just put them right up front so that you don't have to worry about them later on. So I'm going to assume that C is locally finite, by which I mean that my home spaces are finite dimensional and that my objects have composition series, finite composition series. And then if you ever see me talking about projectives, um, I'm, I'm implicitly assuming that I'm in a abelian category, that I have enough projectives. So that those words all make sense and we don't have to think too hard about it. Okay, so that's my basic setup is I'm going to have a pivotal category. I need to redo my definitions. They won't be too different than before, but I do need to be careful about left versus right. So I'll use right, but you could do a left version of everything now as well. But if you're thinking of tensor product as our multiplication, we're no longer in a commutative setting. So we have to pay attention to things like that. So if P is a pivotal category, uh, and a full subcategory is a right ideal, if, well, it's closed under air quotes, multiplication from the right. So if I have a J in I and an X in my category, I want J tensor X to be in I. And two, I still want it to be closed under um, direct summands. So if J is in I and U is in C, and we have an F which goes from U to J and a G which goes back again, such that the composite is the identity on U, then I want that to imply that U is in I. So it's closed under retracts, just as before. Okay, so one, I'm getting rid of several assumptions here. One of them is I'm getting rid of the braiding, so we have to worry about lefts versus rights. The other thing I want to be able to do is get rid of, um, well, let me write down the definition and I'll explain why it generalizes the kind of definition we were looking at before. I think if you see it, you'll see what I'm talking about. So let's fix objects, alpha and beta in C. And then a right alpha beta trace. So this is some other kind of an M trace, um, some other modified trace where it encodes also this alpha and beta on a right ideal. Of course, it's hopefully going to generalize the kind of stuff we talked about before. So, there's a family of K linear maps. Which go from this home space to K. And even before I tell you what the, the, the you know, axioms are here, that the extra restrictions are, let me point out right away, because a referee got confused slash annoyed by the fact that I said it's a trace on I, but these HOM sets aren't necessarily in I, right? V itself starts as an object of I, but once you tensor by alpha and beta on the left side, because it's a right ideal, who knows where you ended up, right? So this is a bit of an abuse of English here to say it's on I, but we stuck to our guns and the referee back down, I guess, because there wasn't a good, better way to say it that we could come up with, such that one, 
that you have a cyclicity property again. So given a U and a V in I and an F from alpha tensor V to beta tensor U and a G which goes backwards without the extra guys. Then let's see if I can get this right. F would go from alpha tensor V to beta tensor U. So I could compose that with, uh, I better double check my notes, yes. One tensor G, or I mean the identity of beta. If I tensor by beta, I end up with beta tensor U to beta tensor V. And so altogether I end up with a map which goes from alpha tensor V to beta tensor V. And that's a thing that I can do TV on. And then on the other side, I think I'm gonna to need to tensor by alpha on the left to get this composite to make sense. So I wanna do alpha, F composed with G and G composed with F, but I have to do a tensor by alpha or tensor by beta respectively for that to parse out and make sense. And then once I've done that, that makes sense to do TU on, and I want those to be the same. And then number two, so that's my replacement for F composed with G and G composed with F should have the same values. And this is number two is the replacement for this sort of closure property. So if I have a U and I and a W, which is just in the category and an F, which goes from alpha tensor U tensor W to alpha tensor U tensor or beta rather tensor U tensor W. Then I have this F guy. Alpha U W. Oh, I screwed up already. Alpha U W beta U W. And since I is a right ideal, U tensor W is a perfectly good thing in my ideal. So I should have a trace for it. So I can just do that. So that's just doing the trace on F as it is. But on the other hand, I could take that F, I won't relabel things, and close up the W loop. And now it's a map from alpha tensor U to beta tensor U. And so I could do the T for U. And those should be equal. So it's still the same closure property. Uh, Lucas, I think I want the alphas and betas to always be on the left side when I tensor, right? So I, hopefully I'm right. Whichever okay, side. The, this really is identity on alpha. Yes. Then, then I'm just confused. Why do you spell it out explicitly? Is there, ah, like this. Okay, now it makes sense. Oh, Thank you. Yep. Tensors before composites. Okay. Uh, yes. So I have just enough room to make a little ob observation. Alpha and beta could be anything, so they could be my unit object. And if it's the unit object, all this degenerates back down to uh, what we had before. So this is just generalizing to the case when alpha and beta don't have to be the unit object anymore. And as a hint to where we're going, in that earlier theorem, when I was talking about using projectives, we had kept having to invoke unimodularity because I need a projective indecomposable to have the same head and same socle. And if I want to get rid of that condition, I have to allow myself to have, even if one of them's the unit object, the other one doesn't have to be. So that's where this definition is coming in, is, is I want to drop unit unimodularity. Okay. All right, so obviously the question here is, is, do any of these guys exist? Or at least are there interesting ones that we don't already know about? Well, I'm gonna need a couple of definitions to set the stage and then, then I'll give you the theorem here. So the first definition is let's let 
P, alpha, and beta be objects of my category and map non-zero. I mean, I guess they could be zero, but then I wouldn't care. Non-zero maps, beta from alpha to P and epsilon from P to beta, such that um, number one, the endomorphism ring of P is local with the maximal ideal consisting of nilpotent elements. So what I have in my mind here is, for example, P should be an indecomposable object and I've got fittings lemma so that I know that this kind of a statement should be true. For example, spoiler alert, the projective indecomposable cover of a module would be the kind of thing that I have in my mind. Two, uh, I want hom alpha p to be spanned by that beta and hom p beta to be spanned by that epsilon. Again, I have in my mind like the projective cover with a simple socle of, of, of some simple module, something like that. But we, we actually went back and forth quite a bit on how much do we want to assume here and how much do we want to add to the um, conditions of our theorems. So if you want to assume that these maps are, you know, one to one and on to or something like that, I would definitely not object to something like that. So yeah, like I said, one project prototypical example would be to do a projective indecomposable object and where your alpha is the socle and your beta is the head of that object. But you could do other things like you could take a finite dimensional simple G module for a Lie algebra G. Think about it as a module just over the Borel subalgebra. And then your highest weight vector is the socle and your lowest weight vector is the head. And so that would be something else that would fit this sort of general framework. Or you could think about tilting modules and you could take up there. There's a standard you know, in, a, in the top and the bottom. So you could do something like that, a standard and a co-standard. All right, so these guys are called trace tuples. P, alpha, beta, beta, epsilon is a trace tuple. And given such a thing, I want to define I alpha beta to be the set of objects such that one and two hold where one is well let me just write it down and then we'll talk about it there exists a sigma from p tensor v to alpha tensor v such that sigma composed of beta tensor one is the identity so we have a map from alpha to P, and if I tensor by V, that gives me a map from alpha tensor V to beta P tensor V, that's eta tensor one. And what I'm asking here is for a splitting of that map. I want a sigma in the opposite direction that, that um, splits it. And also one for the other guy. So let's write that down. There should exist a tau from P tensor V to uh, no, beta tensor V, P tensor V, such that tau composed with epsilon tensor one is the ID suitable identity. And I'll put my little parentheses in so that we don't get confused. Okay, so again, I'm asking for that other map that you can write down to be a half a splitting. All uh, right, so two things. So it's not that hard to check just from the definition that this guy is a right ideal. I mean, these conditions are about um, tensoring V on the left by alpha and beta and having certain maps. And so you can imagine tensoring on the right doesn't mess up with that and taking, and, and if you splitting, you know, maps and so on, all that is, is not that hard to, to track through. They're just on the opposite, acting on opposite sides. 
So the sky will always be a right ideal. And then if you have projectives, then the ideal of projectives will be in here. So it also won't be empty. I mean, there's no reason there should be any Vs, right? But if you have a V which is projective, then these maps are, are automatically gonna split. I should say here, because I realize I haven't said it yet, because you have the duality, um, projectives are automatically injective. You can see that the duality takes projectives to themselves, so they will be injective. And so one of these splits because it's projective, one splits because of injectivity. Perhaps this is a good place to pause for five minutes. Let me take a quick look. Yes, it's a perfect place to pause. Cool, okay. Uh, right, so um, questions so far? So, so can you say again how I should think about eta and epsilon? What, how, um... the, main, the main example that I would keep in mind for this stuff up here is P is like an indecomposable projective. Alpha is its sockle and beta is its head, and these are just the inclusion projection maps. Ah, so, oh, yeah, okay. Yes, you said this. That's going to be our main application in the end, anyway. But but you can come up with other interesting examples, like like tilting modules or or other things. So. Uh, so uh, you use the word um, uniform. You mean that like all submodules intersect, something like this? Oh, what is so you you use the word like uniform category, or maybe I'm messing up the word. Ah, unimodular. Ah, unimodular. Ah, I'm sorry. Nope, that's ah. fine. So unimodular, just for everybody, means exactly that the, at least for me right now, is that the, the, the top of the head cover of the unit object also has the unit object as its sockle. OK. And we assume that the unit object is simple, in, or is this automatically, yeah. automatically? Yes. I'm still assuming that the end well that the endomorphism ring of of the unit object is the field. That's what I need really. I mean this just gives us that the unit object is indecomposable. Right. Like everything we're doing here is on the HOM sets. So if its HOM set looks like a simple object, that's good enough for me. In general, yeah, I, I mean, just to be safe, why don't we just assume that the unit object is simple, like any application I personally have in mind, that's the case anyway, so. So, and, and I, I missed this, you, you said at some point projectives are injectives, but I, I, I missed <laughs> at which point, does it come out or? From yes, which? it comes out of the, um, uh, in a pivotal category, the projectives are always the injectives. Because if you have a projective um, using the S con straightening condition, you can show that P dual is a sum and of P tensor, P dual tensor, mm -hmm. E. And so then it has to be um, projective. But since it's the dual and the dual properties tell you it's injective, so your injectives are projective and vice versa. Yes. But the socket doesn't need to have to be isomorphic to his head, right? For an indecomposable. Yeah, no, I, I, not, not in total generality like this. But, but, you know, if we're looking at like. Sure, I know most, <laughs> most examples are like this. category that will happen. So in the definition of the alpha beta trace, um, there's no special relationship between alpha and beta assumed, right? So it's just, it could be any two objects that you yep. use. Yep. 
Uh, right. So if there are no, no more questions, uh, I guess we can start again. All right. Thanks, Emmett. Uh, yeah, to that last question, like the general setup is quite general, but then to actually prove anything, you need to pile on some assumptions. So, you know, I'll need to assume things about alpha or beta as we go um, to, to actually be able to say anything. Same thing with this trace tuple, like this definition is like ridiculously floppy. So, you know, you can write down trace tuples very easily, but do they do anything interesting for you is the question. All right. Well, maybe here's, that's a perfect segue. Good job. Uh, so the first theorem is, is that if you have a trace tuple, I want to define a alpha beta trace on I alpha beta. So let's take a V in I alpha beta. And let's take a map from uh, uh, alpha tensor V to beta tensor V. And I need to define a scalar attached to that guy. Okay. So here's F. And it goes from alpha V to beta V. And by virtue of being an I alpha beta, uh, the map. I have these sigmas and taus, which do these two splittings. So I'll write it down and we'll double check that it makes sense. I'm going to put a tau right here, which will take me to PV. So let's check. Is that what is that does? Tau goes from beta tensor V, oh, that just almost fits, to P tensor V. So I can put them in right there and compose them. And then what I end up is a, is a map like this guy. And I can, the V, I don't know too much about it, but I could close it up if I wanted to. And then that's a map from alpha to P, which we assumed that we have a trace tuple. And so the space of maps from alpha to P are spanned by eta. So I could define a scalar by just taking that scalar. So, um, T V of F times, I guess I said eta. Okay, that, that's, a, that's a way to get a number from this thing. Um, now, of course, somebody in the audience is probably left-handed and objecting right now that I decided to go to the right like that, or that I decided to use the towel like that, I should say. Um, maybe, maybe we have an Australian, they would rather go down than up. So I could have also taken F and done a sigma down here. And then I would have gotten a map from P to beta once I close up the V side. So I could have also instead defined a map like this because I assumed that that home space also was one dimensional. Okay. And the theorem is whichever one you pick, these are actually the same scalars. And it satisfies the alpha beta trace properties on that right ideal. So there's a bunch of things to check here, of course, right? Uh, being an I alpha beta just said I had some splitting sigma and some splitting tau. So there's choice there. You could choose to do one versus the other. You've got to make sure all these things give you the same answer. And once you've done that, you still have to check that this has the alpha beta trace properties of, of um, cyclicity and, and being able to do a right closure. So there's a bunch of stuff to check. And it's, if you draw the pictures and just sort of do diagrammatic calculus, most of it sort of works itself out without too many surprises or you can look in our paper where we write it down. Okay, uh, so that gives me a well-defined right, we're doing right here, alpha beta traces on this right ideal. Um, we also have a uniqueness theorem, which is that if alpha is one or beta is one, 
then up to scaling by the field, this is the only alpha beta trace on I alpha beta. So if you just took an arbitrary alpha beta trace, you can show it's equal to this up to some uniform scaling. But in general, you know, alpha beta could be lots of things, and so there could be some floppiness there. And, and it's probably pretty hard to say in general for an alpha and beta what this ideal looks like, if it's even non-empty, or what, what kind of traces that you have on there. Um, at least we haven't thought about it too much, but it seems like you could do quite a few different things. All right, so I want to use this to actually give some existence statements then. So theorem. Let's, so let's assume we have, uh, we're having projectives now. So we're in a abelian category with enough projectives. And so let's let beta be a simple object. And let's let P be its projective cover. And let's let alpha be its socle. And maybe I should make some slight assumption to know that there's a unique irreducible at the bottom of this projective. For example, if we're looking at representations of some finite dimensional algebra, that would always be true. So if you have like a finite dimensional Hopf algebra or something like that around, then, then, then that's no problem. And then, so then we have the inclusions. Oops. The projections. And I get my trace tuple, as we talked about earlier. And I also get that proj, the ideal of projectives, is in I alpha beta. I still don't quite know what I alpha beta is. At least I couldn't figure it out. But I know that the proj is in there at least. And so I, because of the previous theorem, we have a trace on this ideal. In particular, it's defined on proj. And so then here's the theorem. Helping it. For any projective, we have a map from um, V beta tensor Q, um, alpha tensor Q, V to K given by the pair J, G, F goes to, I can compose the two. That will then be a map from alpha tensor Q to beta tensor Q. Q is in I alpha beta. So I have a trace map for it, an alpha beta trace map for it, which I'll call TQ. And that'll give me that scalar. So I can do that. I haven't actually said anything yet. And what I want to say here is that this gives me a non-degenerate pairing. My hand must be sweaty because it keeps making it jump. And just to put a pin on it, the V here could have been anything. So for every V, I have this map, and it gives me a non-degenerate pairing for every V, okay, for every object V in C. So that tells me several things. I mean, first of all, it tells me this trace map is not zero, because for example, I could take V to be alpha tensor Q, and there will then be the identity map in HOM alpha tensor Q, alpha tensor Q, and that's got to be not degenerately paired with somebody. So there's, there's at least at least one V that I know of where, where I have to get a non-zero map here. So this, this right trace then in this case is it, on, on proj at least is, is non-trivial. Okay. So let's push it just a little bit further. Apply this. And I get the following corollary. 
which says that um, if I take that C, which is a locally finite K linear pivotal tensor category with enough projectives, and I take P to be the projective cover of one, and I take alpha to be the socle of P, again, maybe, you know, make some slight assumptions so that makes sense. Then if you combine the things I've just been telling you, I can look at the ideal, the alpha one ideal. I have a trace on it because this will give me a, um, uh, I have a trace tuple here. It'll define a trace on this. And because of the previous theorem, it's gonna be a non-trivial trace. Number one. Number two, I told you that as long as one of alpha and beta were the unit object, that that trace was unique up to scaling. So I even can say here that there's has a non-trivial trace, which is unique up to scaling. And then I can't remember if I've told you everything you need to see that this is true, but proj will always be in there as we discussed, but in fact, because it's the unit object, this actually is proj in this case. You just go back to the definition and see that when one of them is one, that the things that are in there are exactly the projectives. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's, this is gonna work perfectly because I have about two more pages left, a page and a half actually. Yeah, so I mean, what you should take from this then is that the, the sort of minimal ideal proj even in the non-unimodular case where I don't even need the socle to match the head, I have a non-trivial trace in, in, in this sense. In particular, particular, alpha could be one. If I'm in the unimodular case, alpha is one, and then I'm getting a trace in the old sense on projectives, and this is on any locally finite K pivotal tensor categories. I didn't need the ribbon structure at all. I didn't need to assume I had a simple projective or anything like that to get it. And it's an explicit sort of construction here. Um, I told you up there, that it's a little bit indirect, but I told you exactly how to compute it. You just have to close up. You find a splitting, you close it up, and, and you take a scalar in front. So it's not, not, it's, 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 it's a, not just an existence theorem. It's semi-constructive. Okay, so uh, if we have such a C, where, um, so now let's assume that we are in the unimodular case, oops. So that the alpha and the beta are both one and one, and then I use my setup, and then what we get here is a non-degenerate pairing on proj, meaning I have this family of linear maps now that I'm in the unimodular case and alpha and beta are both one the alpha tensor U and the beta tensor U are both U, so I'm back to endomorphisms. And these maps give me a non-degenerate pairing for every U and V. If I wrote it down correctly, I think that's the order it needs to go in. And that this, so this gives me a non-degenerate pairing on this guy. And that moreover, um, it has the cyclicity condition. Ooh, I guess if this must be a TU on this side and a TV. Gee. 
And we have a name for a category that has this data. This is like literally the definition, at least for me. Proj is a Kalabi out category. Which is exactly that you have a family of maps, which gives you a non-degenerate pairing like this with cyclicity. Um, and I was asking about finding splittings. I think that's a representation theory problem. It can be hard. I don't think there's some like uniform recipe, at least not that I could think of. I mean, if you have, if you're if you're trying to deal with just proj, then then you know it from universal properties and stuff. But in general, if you want to actually write it down like by some explicit formula, that could be harder. Okay, but it's always exists like in, uh, in just from the property being projective and injective, you can split those maps. Okay. Yeah, so with that's certainly one good, very pragmatic reason to mostly be thinking about proj is because then then you know exactly what's going on with the splittings and that they exist and so on. And in other examples, you would have to really do it the old fashioned way. Uh, so I wanted to mention a couple of papers, which are in the same vein as the results I've just been talking about here. So better look because I'll misspell it. Um, there's, there's one by these authors. Which is projective objects and the modified trace. in factorizable tensor categories. Where among other things, they get a similar sort of statement about the projectives that you're getting a kolabi yao structure. And then another one, um, you can ask Anna about this. She's an author, which is, um, which I like quite a lot, this paper actually. It explains some things that I didn't really grasp before. And that's modified trace is a symmetrized integral. And what they do in that paper is they show that um, for Hopf algebras, if you're thinking about Hopf algebras, you can talk about left and right integrals, which is, you know, a very classical sort of thing to be thinking about. And they show that right modified traces on proj. I believe this is in the unimodular case. So they're not thinking about alpha beta traces. They're thinking about the trace kind of definition from before. I could be wrong. You'll have to ask Hannah about that. But that there's a vector space isomorphism between the space of such things and right integrals on your Hopf algebra H, which is one dimensional. So this goes to a question from some time ago is that at least in certain contexts, you can classify what the, the, what the um, M traces are, at least on proj. And then as I was sort of just explaining up above, having a right modified trace on proj is basically the same thing as saying you have a Kalabi Yao structure And maybe just to bring it all the way back to algebra with one final application is let's say that C is a finite um, pivotal tensor category. Finite here just means it's locally finite in the sense of my earlier definition. The Homme spaces are finite dimensional. You have got finite composition series. And then furthermore, finite is saying that you have um, finitely many simple objects. So this is really just equivalent to saying that your category is equivalent to a category of modules for some 
finite dimensional algebras modules. So that kind of a finiteness condition. Okay. And projectors, sorry. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to talk about projectives in just a second. So I'm assuming it has enough projectives. So yeah. So then what I can do is, since there's finitely many simples, I can take their projective covers and I can make a projective generator by taking their direct sum. So P, P1 through Pn are the projective covers of the simples. And so my category C is equivalent to representations of the endomorphisms of, of Q. And having an alpha beta trace on proj tells me, and we have one because I've got you know, that theorem and, and it applies in this setting, tells me then that, in fact, I'm going to take the um, alpha one trace from before. tells me that I actually have a Frobenius algebra structure here. So in particular, I have a map from um, alpha tensor Q, one tensor Q to K, but one tensor Q is just Q. In this setting, um, maybe I can insert it up here. If you look at EGNO's book, they will prove the next thing I'm going to say and, and explain you know, more about these, these categories. Uh, the Sockel of the projective cover of the unit object will always be invertible, which means that alpha tensor alpha dual is always isomorphic to the unit object. And in particular, if I take a projective in decomposable and tensor by alpha, since it's invertible, that will just be another projective in decomposable. So tensoring by alpha just shuffles around my projective in decomposables. And so in particular, it takes Q to itself. So this is also a Q. Oops, I didn't need that other closure. So this T really goes from hom Q, Q to K. So I said, General nonsense has already told me because it's a projective generator that my category C is equivalent to the representations of NQ, but now I have this map T and this, and it's a non-degenerate map and, and the cyclicity tells me exactly that I get a Frobenius algebra structure on this thing. So the punchline here is this algebra that it's equivalent to is actually a Frobenius algebra. That's it. I'm done. Uh, great. Let's thank uh, let's thank John for uh, his his three lectures. Uh, right. So, any questions? Come, come one, come all. Uh, in this theorem, you used an alpha one trace, and before you constructed an alpha one trace. So is there some dual statement like a one beta trace? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. I, I could have just as well taken um, the indecomposable projective, which has one in its sockle, and then taken the head of that. And that would have also made a trace. Now there's this, this uniqueness statement from before, right? Which said that um, as long as one of them was one, uh, the ideal that I'm studying, which now is proj, there's only one trace up to scaling. So you're not going to get anything really different. Okay. Thanks. Can you repeat the argument why alpha tensor Q is isomorphic to Q if alpha is invertible? Because being invertible here tells me that um, if I take a PI and tensor by alpha, a, it's still projective, and B, because it's invertible, it's going to be um, still indecomposable. So it just permeates around the PIs. 
So if the punchline is, I said it, but I'll write it. Uh, so I, I understood it. Thank you. So you I know, but, but Daniel's going to tell me to write it anyway, so I was going to do it <laughs> for, for posterity. And in fact, I should just you know say, if you happen to be a Frobenius algebra person, you have a Nakayama automorphism, and it's exactly the map induced by tensoring by alpha. When you just write everything down, you see that's what's happening. Can you say a little bit more on a certain assumptions your Frobenius algebra is symmetric or whatever? So the Nakayama automorphism is trivial? Well, it's going to be, I guess, uh, well, Obviously, if alpha is one, then it's trivial. So any U mod yeah. or case would be symmetric. Now, I don't know if there's interesting cases where it still ends up being trivial. Maybe it's obvious that that's never true. Because it definitely is going to move around the projectives because it just takes projective cover to whatever alpha tensor the projective is or the irreducible is. Yeah, yeah I have a related question. So, so can you use it to... Can you use all this setup to prove that actually endomorphism algebras of projectives are symmetric? Or is this somehow as difficult as before? I don't know. I haven't. Um... Mine li like for GLMN, for instance. I mean, these are symmetric algebras, really. But all the proofs I know are by constructing by hands a form. The answer is, I, I, so I've never thought about that, but I think you probably could. You'd have to be a slightly careful because you have infinitely many projectives, right? Even in for a single block. So you'd have to, but the, you can make a projective generator by, by taking some, you know, locally finite endomorphisms or something like this. So um, yeah, you could probably, I, so I don't think that would be a big obstacle to using this, um, having, having infinitely many projectives in your direct sum? That's a good question. I'll think about it. So the main example um, I, I, I think of when someone says, you know, think of something which is non-unimodular is um, various infinitesimal groups, like Frobenius kernels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, has anyone ever uh, studied modified traces for Frobenius kernels, or is there a more classical way of thinking about it that's even older? Um, I don't think anyone studied modified traces for those guys. I mean, this stuff I'm telling you about, sort of the non-unimodular case, there was basically the, the couple of papers I was mentioning in this in this work all came out in the last like two years. So I don't think people have really thought about that. Um, No, that's a good question, though. Kind of along Katarina's question. You've got a bunch of nice general theory here. You know, as your hammer, go look for some nails. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> so let me make one comment on it about that. Uh, there is some papers uh, by Nathan and Bertrand and then some Hopf algebra folks on um, what they call the unrolled quantum group, which to me is a quantum version of um, sort of thick and Frobenius kernels where you take the pre-image of the torus on, under the Frobenius map and so that you have the sort of the full, you know, um, um, torus mm -hmm. in, 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 your, in your guy. And that's kind of what they're doing with quantum groups is they're taking a small quantum group, but they're fattening out the um, carton so that you can still do weight theory. Mm -hmm. and, and they were using um, M traces there to make knot invariants and, and, and also to study them as Hopf algebras. So, if that's working there, then it should work in the kind of settings you're talking about too, I suspect. Thanks. I have a question about the, the original examples of these modified traces. So I think they, they originally studied for these least super algebras, and the motivation was that um, you want to construct not a link, link invariance, but of course you go to the quantum case for mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, 
And if you have, a, have an irreducible module with vanishing super dimension, the corresponding quantum dimension. So that's mm -hmm. why you need these modified traces. So now for these basic classical least super algebras, you have these modified traces and you have non-vanishing modified dimensions. Does it automatically imply that uh, the quantum dimensions of the corresponding objects uh, for the quantized versions don't vanish? Um, That's an excellent question. I think morally it does, but I'm not sure that mathematically it does. Right. Okay. Um, maybe you can use some deformation argument or something to, to do that, but. But you don't know any reference where this would be written up or. So, I would, I, well, I would, my reference would be go ask, Nathan, because <laughs> those guys have done a bunch with quantum groups and quantum supergroups, and and I can't remember off the top of my head if they considered other than the projectives, the the the, the um, typical representations, mm. but but they may well have, but it certainly should be true if, if they haven't done it, it should get worked out by somebody, because mm. definitely, like you said, they exist and are non-vanishing in the classical case, which is certainly strong evidence that they should still make sense in the quantum case. Mm. John, how much of this theory is developed uh, for ideals in the morphism sense, not in your object sense? Uh, I think not much of it has actually been developed, but I think a, a fair bit of it should go through because most everything is about actually about the home sets. But for like the topological applications, they want to just be able to label. They're interested in labeling by objects, their strands and, and getting invariants, obviously. So they're not sort of thinking in that framework. But you know, most of the definitions that I've been writing down, right, they're all about home sets. Right. Other than sort of the initial theorem that I said today, where if the object is ambi, if it has a very particular thing, then then you get something. But yeah, I think I think you should, that would be another way to sort of maybe if you don't have a trace, you can trim down the um, arm sets a little bit to get rid of the annoying morphisms that don't quite work. Right. Yeah. So, is there anything special about the situation when alpha is equal to beta? So, can you like consider the family of of uh, like alpha alpha traces and is it, is it anywhere interesting or special like because um so I, I would be wondering whether one would rather somehow consider like different uh combinations of alpha and beta at the same time or rather just focus uh on a pair of alpha and beta um so for the time being yeah i don't know um I could be wrong. My well, yes. I mean, you could you could simplify your life and, and think about alpha alpha traces, and so that you're only thinking about endomorphisms again. But um, I'm not sure immediately if that particularly buys you something. Now, if alpha is like a simple object, um, I was trying to figure out what would happen if you took like the projective cover, and but then you'd be assuming that the alpha is also the socle. So does that make it? That probably doesn't make it unimodular, does it? So yeah, I don't know what happens if you if you do alpha alpha. I'm not so sure it buys you anything in particular. Okay, so it's not like especially nice to consider endomorphism uh, right still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think sort of our thinking from the very beginning was sort of these applications at the begin at the end that we wanted to be thinking about a projective cover where the head and sockler are different. So we sort of had in our mind that they should be different, but but they're, certainly that's an interesting question. But still, in in that case, you you uh, end up with an endomorphism ring again. So uh, I think right. this is again a bit special, right? And and I think this makes it particularly nice that you are somehow 
like back in the context of the business algebra. Mm -hmm. well, I was wondering whether the other like, more obvious cases where you get back to uh, endomorphisms are also uh, so somewhat special. But uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. That that I that I couldn't quite say, but I mean, well, one one way to interpret this non-degenerate pairing, where was it? Is um, uh, yeah, here this having this non-degenerate pairing here is there's this notion of a Sayer functor where you have a non-degenerate pairing between some Hom spaces where you've applied your functor, I can't remember if it's in this position or in this position, but you have something like this. And so this is really saying you have a pair of functors, tensoring by alpha and tensoring by beta, which are like, in, in, in have some sort of, you know, relationship to each other. So we call it, called it a twisted Sayre functor, functor pair for no good reason. Um, so yeah, you would be talking about the case in particular where like you, you're interested in tensoring by alpha and thinking about that as, as, as you know, having a relationship with itself as opposed to with the identity functor. So what, what that tells you, I don't know. We'd have to unravel the definitions and try to come up with an interesting example or two and see what the heck happens. But that's kind of how I really think about this, this non-degeneracy, or that's one way to think about it is in terms of, of, of thinking of it in terms of Sarah, um, Sarah functors, a generalization of that. Of course, now one of you is thinking, oh, but then I could just replace alpha and beta with like a functor f and a functor g, and I could ask about non-degenerate pairings and what other crazy things could I do? So I have no answer to that either. Um, right, uh, are there any more questions? Yes, can you go back to the slide about the splitting, the de definition of the splitting? Uh, Way up towards the beginning? Uh, I think it's like halfway through. The, um... That's the ideal, that's the trace here. Yes, okay. So I was wondering, so epsilon is supposed to be on two. So if um, the, the, second point, the second point, if the mm -hmm. position is the identity, doesn't that force tau to be identity on the second entry? I don't think so. But, um... I mean, it tells me... Well, I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, I was wrong. Yeah, I mean, I think, in general, you don't know too much. But, and I should say, I mean, for this definition and most of this, the, the maps didn't have to be on to at least not until we get down to things like objective covers and so on. I just need splitting so that I can make sense of the, the, the diagrams I was drawing later. But, um, okay, yeah, I can ask you about this later. Um, another question is if you go all the way back to the first slide. Mm -hmm. um, Oops, oh no, this is all one thing. So now I'm like two days ago, hold on. All right, lecture three, yes. Um, maybe a little bit down. Yeah, so, so that evaluation map, that should go from J dual tensor J to the trivial object. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how should I make sense of WJ being inside of that when you swap them around? Because here, I'm, one way to say it is because I'm assuming it's ribbon, so I have braidings. So oh. J dual tensor J is isomorphic to the other order. So the home space will have the same dimension. So it won't matter. Okay, I was wondering, okay. Mm -hmm. Or I could have put a, like a, a prime on here. Okay, so. Although then I should maybe, put, maybe I should put a twist in there or something like that if I'm being careful. And then unimodularities when they're equal under that identification. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Uh, right. So um, is, is that the last of our questions? Uh, well, if so, uh, let's thank John again for uh, his three uh, lectures this week on modified traces. Thank you. Thanks for meeting me. Thanks for uh, attending the talks in the evening. I appreciate all of that. Not making me get up at you know 4 a.m. to give you talks. That was generous. Um, if you have questions or whatever, just send me an email. I'm always happy to chat. Otherwise, be sure to enjoy your trimester for those of us who are teaching this semester.